will make me give it to you. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be discussing the new Dune movie that was released just this weekend. I wasn't supposed to be able to watch it for a couple of weeks, but by a turn of luck, I was actually able to watch it this weekend, the weekend it came out. So now here I am bringing you Dune movie content, just like every other fantasy sci-fi nerd out there on YouTube. Can we just acknowledge how nice of a paperback this is? Like, look how floppy this boy is. Now, I'm not, I, I don't really care about this cover, but it's such a floppy paperback, and I'm here for it. So this video is going to be split into two parts. The first part of this review is going to be my thoughts on the Dune movie, the movie itself, excluding pretty much all opinions about the book, just what did I think of the movie? What was my opinion on the movie? Should you go see the movie? The answer's yes. And just my thoughts in that general direction. Then the second half of this review is going to be how does Dune, the movie, the Denis News adaptation, stack up to the book, what scenes were and weren't included, and how successful do I think it was as an adaptation of the book rather than just as a piece of film. So without further ado, let's get into my opinions on the new Dune Part 1 movie. So getting into my thoughts on this movie, I have a lot of praise for this movie, but I have quite a few criticisms as well, so I'm going to start with the criticisms and just end with the praise for this movie. But my first criticism is going to be, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I thought the soundtrack of this movie was just straight up weird, and at times I felt like the weirdness of it distracted from the film. I don't necessarily think that the soundtrack itself was inherently bad or there was an anything inherently wrong with the soundtrack of this film, but it just was so weird. There were times I'm like, what, how is this, what are you doing? Like making gargling sounds in the back of your throat? Like, <laughs> like what is happening right now? I was, I was so distracted by some of the parts in the soundtrack. As I said, it wasn't an inherently bad soundtrack, I don't think. I just, it was a bit distracting at times, and I felt like maybe I, I see what the composer was going for here with trying to do something alternative and strange to fit with this sci-fi strangeness of Dune, the movie, but it just, it didn't work for me. My next um, criticism of the movie, this one relates a little bit more to the book, but I felt like the movie did a terrible, terrible job of displaying the importance and the significance of water on Arrakis. I can only think of a couple scenes throughout the entire movie where they really drive home the point that water is the currency on this planet. It is what's important. It is such a central part of Dune's environment and its plot and the story, and I felt like it, the movie really just missed the mark on that one. Like it didn't, it didn't explain that well. I could, there was one scene where they were like watering trees that maybe sort of drove home that point a little bit, but some of the scenes that were excluded from the movie were what drove home the importance of water in the first half of the book, and I felt like by excluding those scenes, not necessarily that excluding those scenes was a bad thing in itself, but by excluding those scenes, they pushed out all of this stuff that explained the importance of water on Arrakis, and that was a bit frustrating to me because that is such a huge part of the book. Now, it's they can certainly improve upon this in the second movie, and I think this is definitely something that they can fix in part two because water does have more significance in part two than it does in part one, but that frustrated me a little bit that they just didn't do a good job with that. My next con is that the movie also didn't do a very good job of displaying uh, the Duke's political expertise and how much he knew that he was walking into a trap and how much he tried to avoid getting caught by the trap. Like, there's so much other stuff that goes on in the book that the Duke hears about and that he knows about and that he tries to circumvent, but he still falls into the trap anyways. And the movie was kind of just like, well, we know it's a trap, but we're gonna go anyways because we have to. But yeah, the movie didn't do a great job 
of displaying the, uh, the Duke's political expertise because he is an incredibly smart man and he's incredibly politically adept and although the movie didn't make him seem stupid either like the movie certainly made him seem like a smart and intelligent man it also didn't do quite as good a job as I would have liked of displaying that political expertise that the Duke displays in the book. The movie just overall really lacked character development for a lot of the characters the Duke just being the main one that stood out to me. I just, Paul's character especially, like he just felt bland and it just, the character development definitely could have been better. But again, it's also important to take into account that this is a film, not a book. So there is a limited runtime, there's a limited amount of screen time that they have to develop these characters. So while the character development certainly was not where I wish it would have been, I can also be a little bit more lenient in that criticism of the movie as I understand why it was the case even though it was still a problem. My last sort of criticism is just kind of fun but Paul is so whiny in this movie especially the first half of this movie he is so whiny like he, he there's this fight scene with him and Gurney Halleck and Paul's just over here like I'm not in the mood okay or when we have the scene when Jessica's trying to get him to use the voice on her when he's just like, Well, I guess I'm just tired and not in the mood. I also love this scene where Paul is being whiny and Lady Jessica's like, you want water? And Paul's like, yeah. And Lady Jessica's like, well, make me give it to you. I just thought that was funny. But anyhow, I just... <laughs> Paul is not a very likable character in this film, I personally felt. I mean, even though I love Timothy Chalamet as an actor, Paul was just, didn't do it for me. Granted, in the book, Paul is supposed to be 15 years old. And in the movie, I would say they aged him up to, they were trying to give him this vibe of maybe like somewhere in the 17 to 19 year old range. But even still, like, uh, he was just not very likable, especially for somebody who hasn't read the book and doesn't know what he becomes. All right, that is it for like my major criticisms of the movie. I'll get into some more later when I talk about how the movie compares to the book, but now it's time to get into what I liked about this movie. So my first praise for this movie is actually the acting. I know there has definitely been a lot of back and forth on some people will think the acting was really great in this movie, some people think it was terrible. I'm on the I personally think it was great side. I th do think that they all did an outstanding job with what they were given. Um, the performance that stood out, stood out to me most was Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica, but I'm also a little bit more biased towards her as she was the actress that I knew best going into this film and I knew her work best and I already very much like her as an actress, but her performance and her portrayal of Lady Jessica really stood out to me in this film. I know there's been some people upset with the fact that like she didn't actually read the book, but guys, to call Dune a dense book would be generous. That's an understatement. This book for a normal person to read, they're going to find it incredibly dense and incredibly hard to get through. I'm just kind of under the impression that if you didn't read the book before watching this movie, that's fine. That's totally okay. I am definitely one of those people who is a diehard. I have to read the book before I watch the movie. I don't think there is any book to movie adaptation that I have ever watched without reading the book. Okay, I feel like there actually is one, but I can't think of what it is. Anyhow, where was I? Oh yes, acting in the movie it was good. How did I get from there? I don't know, the acting was good. Next pro. Another thing that I liked about the movie that I actually liked very much about the movie was just the cinematography, the color palette that they used for the movie, and just the overall, the way the film looked was incredible. The visual effects were stunning. I fell in love with this world that Frank Herbert and Denis Villeneuve created and brought to light. And the way that it looked on screen was just incredible. I was so impressed with the way that both Caladan and Arrakis looked on the screen and just the attention to detail that I felt went into the set 
was incredible and I was so 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 impressed. My next pro that again might be more of a me thing and not like a generally accepted that a lot of people liked would be I actually felt the pacing of the film was very good. I thought it was very well paced and very just a good pace for the film. I am also the reader who is currently reading Read of Time and feels like the slog isn't a slog though so um, don't necessarily t take all of my opinions on pacing with a grain of salt. And for my final pro we have Literally any time Duncan Idaho was on screen. Oh my gosh. If I had to pick another performance that stood out to me next to Rebecca Ferguson's, it would be Jason Momoa's as Duncan Idaho. He was so likable and I loved it. I'm here for it. We stan Jason Momoa as Duncan Idaho. It was great. Just another aspect of this movie that I want to mention really briefly that I thought was amazing was I remember making this comment to my mom after watching the film. I was like, I feel like the male actors had more makeup on in the, than the females in this movie. Lady Jessica in particular throughout this film seemed so human. I hate movies where they do this thing where it's like women are trapped in the middle of the jungle and they, they've been through, they've been stuck in the jungle for a week and their makeup is perfect and maybe they have one cut on their face strategically placed on their forehead or their cheeks so it doesn't mar their beauty. Or like they're in a fight and they're wearing high heels and their hair is down. Like what the heck? This movie did not do that at all. Even it, even like Lady Jessica, it would have made perfect sense for her to have been all made up in a lot of these scenes. But instead, the movie went this direction where they were very minimalistic with the makeup and she just looked so tired. She looked haggard. She looked like she hadn't slept in a week. Her eyes were just like the whole movie. It just, she seemed so human and I appreciate that so, so much. That is it for sort of my pros and cons just of the movie, what I thought of it. Just some other notes. Um, I've heard a lot of people saying they're like, ah, oh, like the trailer made it seem like Zendaya was going to be in the movie so much, but Zendaya is hardly in there at all. So? That's not a criticism. Like I've seen that proposed as a criticism that Zendaya isn't in the movie enough. sorry? I don't know. It's certainly, if, if you're sad that Zendaya wasn't in the movie enough, like that's fine, but please don't play it off as a criticism of the movie because you can't criticize a movie for not having your favorite actor or actress in it as much as you wanted it to. That's not, that's not a criticism. This is neither a criticism nor a complaint, but the costuming was just, eh, it was fine. I think it was particularly bad or particularly stunning either. The still suits looked good, costuming was good, the Fremen, the way that they were dressed was fine. It was just fine. It wasn't bad, it wasn't good. And lastly, I don't feel like I made this very clear in like my pros and cons, like it seems like I had a lot of criticisms of the movie, like despite the praises, but this movie was so much fun to watch. It is such an enjoyable film and just purely as a film, just forgetting the book that exists. It's such a great movie. I highly recommend you go see it or watch it on HBO Max or go see it in theaters because it was so good. It was fun. It was enjoyable. It was well paced. The acting was good. It just was a good movie. But on that note, it's time to move into the book versus the movie. How does the movie compared to the book, what scenes were taken and adapted well, what scenes did they leave out, and do I think it was a good idea for them to have left those scenes out. So I'm just going to quickly go through all the scenes that I thought were important that they left out and all the scenes that were sort of unimportant that they also left out. I'm going to go very briefly into detail on why I think it was a good idea or not a good idea for them to leave these scenes out of the movie. The first important plot point from the book that wasn't included in the movie was this idea that Lady Jessica was plotting against the Duke, 
but this was just what the Harkonnens wanted a duke and all the duke's advisors to think and it was this whole big thing and then duke the duke went to his son and was like hey they're trying to make me think that your mom is plotting against me i don't actually believe that she's plotting against me but i'm gonna go with it so we can try to figure out who the real traitor is because they knew that there was a traitor like within the house of Trades that was gonna betray them at some point and it was this whole thing and that wasn't really in the movie at all nobody ever doubted jessica's loyalty for a moment <laughs> I think that they really could have gone either way as far as including this in the film. I think it would have been a good idea to include it in the film, but I also don't think it was necessary to make a good adaptation to include this in the film, and I completely understand them cutting this from the film because of runtime. The next is a much smaller plot point that they didn't include, but is very important and I felt like maybe they should have included was the fact that the Sardaukar um, the Emperor's soldiers were disguised as Harkonnens in the book. In the movie, they, they really just weren't. I mean, they made a very clear distinction for the audience that, hey, the Harkonnens are dressed in black and the Sardaukar are dressed in gray. <sighs> it was made very clear that this is unusual for the Emperor to have his armies attack one of the great houses and that this was not okay. But I also felt like maybe they could have had the Sardaukar disguised as Harkonnens. And like they, they could have included that in the movie and they had the runtime for it, they just didn't. The next plot point that they didn't include was uh, the fact that Gurney is alive and gets into smuggling. Um, I assume they're going to include this in the second movie, but I felt like that uh, narratively wise and time wise they could have included this. In the first movie probably again i'm sure they cut this because of runtime but i felt like this as far as where this is in the timeline it really probably should have been in the first movie the next massive plot point that i am actually probably the most upset that they messed up was paul besting Jameis when they first meet and the whole duel scene at the end of the movie in the book the duel scene is an incredibly important moment and a turning point for Paul. In the movie, they totally just glossed over it. Like, they were just like, Jameis was like, I want to fight you. And Paul was like, okay. Eh. And then killed him. And it wasn't an impactful moment at all. Like, it just felt like it was there. It made me kind of frustrated because this is such a big deal in the book. Like, you have this whole duel scene where it's it's explained that like it seems like Paul is toying with him because he's so used to fighting people with shields and he's never killed someone before and then he has to kill Jameis because he has no other option it's it's, it's him or Jameis so he has to kill Jameis and then there's a funeral where he cries because he's so upset and he's so human and none of that was in the movie like I mean Lady Jessica briefly says something about Oh, he's never killed anyone before. Like, he's not toying with him. He's just, he's never committed murder before, as if that's a weird thing. So, that made me pretty frustrated, and I felt like even if they had to add some extra runtime for that, that is something that most definitely should have been emphasized more in the film. The next thing that they didn't really include in the film was a more detailed explanation of the Missionaria Protectiva, I believe is what they were called. Um, basically these women that the Bene Gesserit had like put on different planets to like set up a sort of path almost or way for future Bene Gesserit to gain power with the natives of these planet. They like set up myths or religions or stuff like that. And this is like briefly mentioned when like Paul is on a flight with his mom and he's like, yeah, you doing all your Bene Gesserit meddling with the people of this planet. And it's just, again, it's just glossed over. I feel like maybe it could have been explained a little bit better. Um, the Reverend Mother says something about like, a, a way has been laid on Arrakis for y'all. Um, again, it's, it's poorly explained. I don't even know that the name Mission Area Protectiva is even mentioned in the movie. So, I feel like maybe that one should have been explained a little bit more. Lastly, for very major important scenes that weren't included was the feast or dinner scene and the fact that other major houses, like they, they live on Arrakis, like they're there too. 
they they attend this feast um, at Duke Leto's mansion, and um, it's it's a lot of political maneuvering, a lot of information is discovered, and it's more character development for Paul, Lady Jessica, and Duke Leto, and that entire scene was just not in the movie, and in fact, you never interact with any of the houses other than the Harkonnens and the Atreides. So, again, I am... 100% certain they cut this for runtime because they did not have the time for this at all. But it's just, it, again, this is part of the reason why the, the impact of water wasn't as fully explored in the movie as it was in the book. Like, there's this whole scene where the Harkonnens used to, like, set out wet rags for the people to, like, fight over to drink from and... Uh, the Duke Leto is just like, why don't you just give them some water instead of being mean. Some minor scenes that weren't included in the film that I'm just going to brush over really quickly. Um, a better explanation of the Hunter Seeker and how Paul was able to circumvent being killed by that. They didn't really explain what that was in the movie. Lady Jessica and like all of their supplies being trapped by a sand slide when she and Paul are out in the desert trying to find the Fremen. There's also a change that the movie made where Paul and Lady Jessica, to cross big expanses of sand in the book, they use thumpers rather than the sand walk, but in the movie they use the certain walk that the Fremen use to not make rhythms. Lastly, the movie changed the way that Liet Kynes dies in the book. She is just sort of swallowed by sand, or he, as he is in the book. In the movie they um, gender swapped Liet Kynes so that she's a girl in the movie, uh, they were a guy in the book. I don't really care. Um, I don't think anybody else really cares either. The character really worked either way. But in the movie, um, she was killed by Harkonnens or Sardaukar. I wasn't sure which it was. And then in the book, uh, he, short he sort of just was swallowed by the sand, I guess. Just some other notes on the accuracy of the book versus the movie. Paul was aged up in the movie. I mentioned this earlier. I don't actually have a huge problem with uh, books aging up their characters when they turn it into a movie, unless it's like a big deal, like stuff like Harry Potter or Percy Jackson. Like I thought it was a terrible idea to age up Percy Jackson in his film adaptation. But aging up Paul I didn't feel like was a huge deal at all. Like the fact that he's 15 in the book doesn't really mean anything. It's just he's supposed to be young. He's supposed to look young and I feel like the movie captured that well enough that I did not mind the age up at all. I thought it was totally fine. Wheel of Time is aging up their characters in the TV show. I think that's totally fine. Aging up isn't something that normally bothers me in an adaptation. Just another thing that I thought was kind of fun is that a lot of the actors and actresses match my headcanon for the book very very well. Just to conclude, I do think that the movie was certainly uh, really good and very successful just as a piece of film and as a work of art in that sense But I also think that it was very successful as an adaptation I know I only went into all the stuff that wasn't included, but I also feel like I have to mention everything that was in the movie I think like 90 95 to 99 percent of what was in the movie was in the book, too the movie seemed to pull exclusively from scenes that were in the book rather than making stuff up to fit in the story or make it better for readers. And I really, really appreciated that. I think that the movie was incredibly successful, not only as a film, but also as an adaptation of the book. I was very, very impressed, as past attempts have proven Dune is an incredibly difficult book to adapt. And for Denis Villeneuve to pull it off this well was just so impressive. I enjoyed it so much. Again, both as a film and as an adaptation. That being said, I know that this was, this film was a good adaptation, but I also, also think it's really important to sometimes separate films from what they were adapted from. It's possible for something to be a good movie, but also to be a bad adaptation. This is one of my biggest pet peeves with sort of the book to movie adaptation and fandoms from the book and the movie, you have examples like Aragon or Percy Jackson and how, yes, the movie was adapted from a book. Was it successful as an adaptation? No. But was it a good movie? Yeah. 
it was fine. So that is largely why I split this video into two halves. I think that any time there is an adaptation, it is important to see the adaptation as more than just, hey, this is a book turned into film. I'm going to try to look at the Wheel of Time show under this same lens. First off, looking at how good of a show was it? How was the cinematography? How were the visual effects? How was the acting? And then take another step and look at how it compared to the books. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Did you disagree with any of my opinions? Were there any scenes that you thought really, really should have been included when they weren't? Or were there any scenes that you were like, why did that need to be in the movie as opposed to this? Please let me know in the comments. If you want to keep up with what I'm reading, be sure to follow me on Instagram at Radiant Reads Reviews, and I will see you all in the next video.